Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. <clears throat> Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And it's episode 44, and we're going to be looking at working with the delusional client this week, Bob. Another one of your wonderful titles. 44, all the fours. Do you know, it won't, it, I feel like it needs saying. It won't be long before we've done 12 months of the podcast, Bob. No, we are. There's no delusion here. We've, got, we've had 44. 100% 44. <laughs> maybe if you, believe, if you, if you, you believed as a child... Um, that uh, people exaggerate things because you had a parent which always told you, you know, oh, people, they're always prone to exaggeration. Don't you believe it? Do you, don't you believe it? Have you met my mum, Bob? That's something no. she That's used to say. <laughs> <laughs> then, then it might be very normal for you to either check that out or perhaps minimise that or even believe it's not true. Yeah. So we're talking about delusion here. And when I'm talking about delusion, again, I probably say this in most podcasts, but I want people to really, you know, get this, that about most things we have a continuum. Yeah. We have a continuum for people who uh, on one side, it's sort of, it's different levels of delusion, really, who they may have a contaminated belief systems all the way up to psychosis. Yeah. Where uh, if we give a definition of psychosis, the definition, definition of psychosis is when you're out of touch with reality. Now, if, there's a, if this was a podcast on psychosis, we can now talk a little bit about what you can call on the spot psychosis, where people drift in and out of um, psychosis in terms of what's real and what's not real, we could, which is often called florid psychosis or we could talk about when people have fixed psychosis and they feel out of touch with reality for a lot longer than just a moment in time but as it's not about psychosis uh, i'm really talking about i think um we might get back to psychosis because often some people who are psychotic can also have have what we're talking about in this podcast anyway might be termed extreme delusions and paranoid fantasies. So, but that's that's on the real sort of, I, I think the extreme side of what people talk about when they talk about delusions. I think what most people talk about with the delusions what, are what we call in transactional analysis psychotherapy contaminations. Yeah. So child contaminating the adult and parent contaminating the adult and yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so what we mean by contaminations basically is when early in the person's history they hear a certain parental slogan and they may accept it as adult reality so in other words yeah you know, people listening to this podcast and they think about their own families they probably can remember many times when there might be parental slogans like kids sh should be seen and not heard. Uh, I don't know what parental slogans you might have had in your childhood that you could have remembered, Jackie. Um, yeah, that was one that was banded around as well. Yeah. Yeah, one of my mum's favourite ones, I'm not sure whether it was a parental slogan, but it was one that was always used, was, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. She was yeah, always yeah. throwing that one out there. Yeah, and what's <laughs> really important there is, is how the child interprets what that means. Yeah. Now, I don't know what, as a kid, you interpreted what was meant by that, yeah. But I expect you did. 
And then from that, you would have made a decision. Yes, yeah. And then that becomes, you know, something you then take into adulthood. Yeah. So if I go back to what one I just said, kids should be seen, not heard. Yeah. And if the child believes as, that as adult reality, in other words, as if it was true. Yeah. They might, at the age of 44, come into my consulting room and say things like, you know, what I'd really like to change is my um, aloneness. I feel like I'm always alone in life. I don't feel that I'm assertive. I don't feel that I can assert my belief systems or my thoughts or my feelings. And people call me a doormat. And as you explore that more, you can see where the decision from childhood. So the parental slogan is kids should be seen and not heard. Yeah. Child thinks it's adult reality and decides, well, I better be quiet to survive in this world. And then that's taken into relationships in later life. And then the person comes in at 42 and says, well, I've always been so timid. People don't understand why I don't express my opinions. But, you know, I actually feel it's quite dangerous for me to express my feelings and thoughts. Yeah. So that could be a delusionary system. But if you trace it back, it makes pure sense. Yeah. This is the thing with the, the scripted stuff and, and, you know, what you were saying about the, the child and everything, the way it's interpreted, it does make sense and it does become survival and a lot of it feels life and death stuff. It is like, it is because if that's, if you, if you, what happens, the child makes this decision as well, I better be seen, you know, I better not be seen um, or, or whatever interpretation is. And if, they, if I go against that, I'm going to get hit by my dad or whatever it is. Yep. And it does become survival. Yeah. It can become deluded. What about, here's another system. What about, you know, when the parent says, you know what, John or Jack or whatever his name is, you know what, son, you should never, you know, never trust anybody in this room because no one is trustworthy. Yeah. Um. So then the child decides. Well, he can't trust anyone. 52 years later, they turn up in my therapy room saying, you know what, I can never maintain relationships. I always have real, real problems with people in life. I've got no real friends. And I think it's because I don't trust anyone. Yeah. Now, it's a deluded system. Because yes, yeah. that parent message is untrue. Because the truth is, the real truth is, well, some people may not be trustworthy. And the real truth is many people are trustworthy. But what's certainly a delusionary system is when the child makes the decision, well, therefore, I won't trust anyone. Yeah. Interesting enough with, with that particular example, it does depend how we interpret it as children. Yes, of course. One of the things with that that mm. I, I whether yeah, I personally interpreted it is it's not necessarily that I don't trust other people. It's often that I don't trust myself. <laughs> well, as a child, as a child, if you've got a parent saying, "Don't trust anybody. Don't trust okay. anyone," because the world's not trustworthy place and you can't trust anyone. Yeah. Then, okay, you may, I, I'm not quite sure how you would shift it yourself, but you could. But I think it's more likely you would decide, well, I won't trust anyone then. Yeah. To survive in this world. Yeah. Because when we look at it from a child's point of view, it is very black and white. That's how children see things. It's all or nothing. There is no grey area. That's right. But yeah. can you see how... It's a distorted system. Yeah. Which we could call delusion if we want to. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think that's one of the ways I always describe, you know, script and, and those sort of things is it is very black and white. It's, you know, as a child, when we made these decisions and choices, we didn't have the life experience to, to work it out. We took it on face value at our understanding level. And that then became part of our belief system. Oh. And 100%, we bring it back day after day. <laughs> it's it's in there somewhere yeah oh. and the more younger that uh, parental slogan the more bizarre it is the more toxic and more distorted the script belief system comes and the more delusionary or distorted in life those belief systems might be yeah so somebody comes into the I'm not talking about the narcissistic grandiosity self particularly here, but I mean, I don't, we could go into character types. We'll just pick another one. Somebody comes into your therapy room at the age of 47 or 37 or whatever it is and says to you, do you know what? Um, do you know what? I think people can actually read my mind. I tell you what, I tell you why I think that because I can read people's minds. And I'm not, I'm not uh, the only one, surely. I can read all these, you know, and I think other people can read my mind as well. And it's very, very, very scary. Now, is that delusion or distortion or not? It is obviously delusion because it's not was, true. Yeah, I was going to say it's definitely delusion. People can... If you know very, like I've been married 30, nearly, well, actually 27 years. Can I read my wife's mind? No, I wouldn't want to, but can I? But what I can do, I've had a, if I have a good guess about a repeated predictable style of behavior. Yeah. So, and I may get it right and I may get it wrong, by the way. Uh, so what I tend to do, what I do do is ask her what she's thinking rather than guess what she's thinking. In couples therapy, particularly, you get this process of people who've been around a long time who actually go along a process of never, never, um, or, or believing that the other person should understand what they're thinking. <laughs> you know? yeah. And of course, we're not mind readers. It's true, the longer we've been with people, we might have good guesses, but 50% of the time we'll be going, get them wrong. wrong. Yeah. yeah. So it's a deluded, distorted picture when I, believe I can read people's minds yeah or other people can read minds however here's a philosophical assumption for you that I believe in therapy if we however bizarre the statement or the behavior seems in present day yeah if we trace it back to the origins or the context of where this whole process began, it makes total sense. Yeah. How That's the bit I sense? love. Yeah, yeah, it does. It makes total sense. Even though they themselves will sit there when they get that insight about where it actually originates from and they go, but that is just ridiculous. And it's like, it might seem it now, but back then it made perfect sense. Yeah, so they trace it back, go right back. And what you learn is that the child um, had to had to believe in these supernatural abilities, because unless they believed they could read everybody's mind, they would get very hurt or beat up or whatever it's like. So they developed a way of being to try and protect themselves. And then you get a distorted delusionary system, yeah. which may go on for a long time. Or they might have had a parent that said that. You know, if you try hard enough, you can actually tell what people are thinking so. And then they interpret, and there we are, 45 years later, come into my office with a distorted, deluded system, obviously. But if you trace it back to where the trauma began, everything makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's... it. it it's an amazing thing when we work all this stuff out. The, one of the things I do often talk to clients is it, it's okay knowing where it comes from, 
redeciding it or making a new choice can be quite anxiety provoking sometimes when we step out of our comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the second part of the treatment. The first, well, you've got different parts in a psychotherapy treatment. I believe the first part is getting to know the client in front of you. Yeah. Um, creating a safe, secure, protective relational space for that to happen in. And as you, as you go through the process and have an understanding of them, the next part is to help them understand themselves and help them being aware of how past affects present. Yeah. From that, the third part of the psychotherapy sequence is what you're talking about, helping them then make new re-decisions from the younger self of where the trauma happened, which takes a long time. Yeah. And the fourth part is helping them reintegrate those new behaviors into their life today. Yeah. And we have a four part psychotherapy sequence. Yeah. And it's nice to look at it in that way that there is there is a journey, there is a process to it. And you know, I often talk with clients about sometimes we rubber band back and sometimes you know it you it's the cusp of moving over into that new area i think it might have even been steffi that said it once in a second right, you mean? yes yeah and she said it's kind of like you've got two trains one's very familiar you know exactly where it's going to stop you know the people that are getting on it and off it and you know where it ends up and everything and what therapy does is ask you to get on a new train <laughs> that you don't know where it's going. You don't necessarily know who's going to get on and off at the stops and everything. But we can always get back on the old train if we need to. And that just kind of made me feel a bit safer. It's it's not do or die with all of this stuff. We will revert back to scripted stuff when we're stressed, when we're overwhelmed. It's not like that part of us never comes back again. No, however, I think the first step it's allowing the therapist on the train. Good point. Yes. Therapy takes a very, very long time if the client doesn't allow the therapist on the train. And in fact, the train won't even start unless that bit's sorted out. Yeah. Now, the delusion, you know, we're talking about deluded client, we're talking about a contaminated client. And there has to be a lot of work dealt with um, to for the for the person to feel safe enough to allow the therapist on the train to even get in a process, of, you know, helping them understand their developmental history. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes they might not, you know, we, we're talking really early in their life. That there's certain things that they might not remember or that they've forgotten about that needs unearthing or looking at or exploring. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think the more, you know, if we look at a lot of these personal adaptations or personality styles, you know, quite often a level of grandiosity is labeled to these levels of disturbances with particular clients we can talk about. And if we're talking about grandiosity, we often could be talking about not, you know, a very short step to delusion. Mm. Yeah. I've been doing a bit of work in, in my own personal stuff on Facebook and things about gaslighting over the past few weeks and when you were talking earlier on about losing sense of reality and things like that it just sort of triggered that for me that you know sometimes in relationships we can be manipulated to to lose our own sense of reality oh yeah that happens a lot touch of with our own <laughs> truth yeah. if that makes sense of course you know, if we're in a very dysfunctional, traumatic system, or you know, we know this happens a lot in, in school, schoolyard, of course. But yeah, you know, the 
the, you know, like the dysfunctional parents or significant people or caretakers, their reality has to be the most paramount. Yeah. And the other person, kid, the kid's reality has to be wrong. Yeah. And that's gaslighting. You misunderstood it. You didn't, yeah, yeah, 100% it's gaslighting. Yeah, yeah. And so that's where a lot of this starts. Yeah. In the actual family home. Yeah. Now, it might get played out in the schoolyard or different places, but it's often modelled, I think, um, much younger on. If we look at the technique or the theory around the OK Corral, which you know I'm OK yeah. with, in different life positions, then if we talk about gaslighting, we can then talk about, we can, we can certainly see where that, those positions are on the OK Corral. Yeah. But you know what? If we go back to what we're talking about here, the most important thing is, is that the client can make the therapist okay enough to actually get onto that train with them. Yeah. Which is is it's a it's a big step mm. to do that. Yeah. Mm. We're not gonna get on that train on session one. <laughs> no, and depends on the type of clients you've got of course but you might not be on it by session 50 yeah hopefully you'll be on it perhaps before you know but earlier on than that or the um client will probably have got off on the next station yeah it's an interesting thing, Bob. I, I love the way that you, you talk about things. It just tweaked my interest then when you were saying that. One of the criticisms I often hear about therapy is that therapists are all in it for the money. That's why you keep seeing your clients for five years or 10 years or whatever it is, that it's so that you get loads of money off them. You don't want to cure them or help them or support them because then you're you're losing a client. But when you were saying then about, you know, it's the client letting the therapist on the train with them. It is down to the client. What's we that? Can't, we can't make our clients do anything in, in the therapy room. We can't get them to trust us on session one it's it's a process i think it's impossible almost that any client in session one will get on that train i mean i, I know some do so it's not impossible but it's a rarity it takes a it takes you know a, a few sessions yeah but if a client came to us with anxiety or I don't know, a fear of something, whatever it was. And, you know, if they go and have CBT, say, for example, they get eight sessions and that's it, it's over. And theoretically, they're, they're OK with that. Therapy is completely different. Well, the type of therapy you and I talk about on these podcasts is very different because that's relational. Because we're talking about relational long term psychotherapy. Yeah. 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 The, the, the two completely different beasts they can't be compared to each other but a lot of the time people do compare it it's yeah. like they'll they'll come and you know they, they'll ask me how many sessions do you think i'll need <laughs> i don't know how long is a piece of string <laughs> well if somebody comes with fixed delusions and they, they, they are delusionary systems or distorted systems or of levels of grandiosities, which actually isn't helping them in life anymore, then you know probably there's been high trauma. Mm. So you can actually say something back to them. Well, the more trauma you have in your history, by definition, we're talking about quite a few stops. Quite a, this train will probably go on quite a long time. Yeah, and you can always get off, and we will get to the end sometime. Yeah. But one thing's really important, that you and me will be there together. And I'm not getting off this train. If you are, and I'd really like it if we go the journey together. Yeah. Now that might take 
quite a long time for them to actually trust me up to get off on, on to get on the train. Um, but that's what I'm aiming for. I think that's really important as well. What you said that I'm not getting off the train. <laughs> no. Yeah. Off this train, you might pull the red chain or whatever it is, and we can stop and look around the field and look around the landscape and talk about how you're feeling and hopefully we'll continue when it's safe. Yeah. We might have to chuck some people off the train. We might have to evict people off the train because we don't want people on the train who shouldn't be on our train. So we might have to... I love that. <laughs> no, that might happen, but we'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. And like a, a very wise person once told me that therapy is a, it's, it's a process, it's not an event. Never an event. <laughs> It's never, never an event. Yeah. And these delusions, these distorted systems, these contaminations, they're way back in history. Yeah. Now, what I said was delusions, the more extreme and intense and bizarre and traumatic um, processes they've come from can sometimes move into a level of psychosis, which um, takes quite a lot of, tending to but if you can catch the contaminations earlier then we're into a you know maybe a different process in therapy yeah but in the end of the day all these uh, systems and belief systems that we believe in are built they're there to keep us safe That's so good. Yeah, it has to be a gradual process. Yeah. And the other thing is, as you said earlier on, we have to get to a place where the person may, you know, it's done enough healing and trauma to put a different show on the road. Yeah. That's, that's the end result. That's where we want our clients to be. It's to make a choice. You know, I, I know for me sometimes, I it took me a long time to get to know my scripted stuff, but I know I revert back to it at certain times. It, I well, don't stay in it for any length of time now, and I know yeah. when I'm in it, I do it in awareness, which is completely different, but I still go there sometimes. Yeah, so if you've decided, you know, if you've been in a system where you've accepted parental slogan, you know, uh, as adult re reality because that's how you survived in your childhood system that the world's not a trusting place then sometimes you may under stress go back to that system you know because that's the way, one you knew but hopefully as you've said if you've done some therapy and worked on yourself a bit you might get out quicker yeah yeah definitely get out quicker and I'm aware when I'm in it I know when I'm there now and I'm not shocked you know, in the well, it's all out of awareness. A lot of it, I, you know, yeah. It's it's just that circular stuff of doing the same thing and expecting a different result. A lot of the time. Thank you, Bob. I haven't looked okay. at our list again, so I don't know what we're doing next time. So it will be a surprise. I'll be astonished. <laughs> I, I don't think it's a delusion, this is. I think it's reality. I'll be astonished, you know, if, if we get to an end of one and you, you've got the... Uh, oh, I don't know if I'd be astonished, because it's only in, sometimes you do know what we're going to do next time. Yeah. I need to look at three ones instead of looking at... Two. I always have two in the back of my head, but not the third one. Yeah. Um, well, there are lots, I've, I've provided a big list, so, you know, it's uh, it's not surprising, really. And, and that's okay, because on another level altogether, you know, spontaneity and, um, you know, coming along and listening to podcasts and then be delighted with what you're going to, we're going to talk about is really fine as well. I like that. I'm sure the listeners are delighted about what we talk about every week. Thank you so much, Bob. And we will be back next time with episode number 45. Oh, oh hang on. Yes, that's right. Uh, 45. Oh, my gosh. Oh, surprise. You know, one, one thing that I didn't put on the list of podcasts is surprises, uh, excitement curiosity 
in the world of the psychotherapist. I didn't put that, but that would be a wonderful title. Do you want to do that one, Bob? Yeah, not not next one, but we could have it on the list. There was something else that you said as well that I'm not sure whether it's on the list, but we need to put it on the list, is um, synchronicity in the therapy room. Oh, yes, yeah. I quite That's liked the thought of that one. There's, there's loads. There, literally, there isn't an episode that I'm not looking forward to, Bob. Great. Well, it's been nice talking about this, the, this subject tonight. Okie dokie. Right, so I shall see you next time. Okie dokie. Take see care. you. Bye. 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 You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.